What up? Mark Cott. Good episode ahead. It's the doldrums of the Simmeral Prep season. That's actually not the good part of the pod, but it is the midway point as well. So that's going to give us a chance. We're going to look at top five storylines for the second half of the Simmeral Prep season. Most teams have eclipsed that midway point. So let's dive in. Let's see what's going on. Finally, things are starting to take shape. It moves at a little bit slower pace at the prep level than it does at the collegiate and the and the professional levels just because of the number of games they're playing. So it's we don't get the large enough sample size to start delineating the team. So we're going to dive into that. Uh, Steve Kerr, big breaking news. Uh, he's announced, or well, he didn't announce anything, but there's been news that he's signed a two-year extension, uh, was being facetious and saying we were going to do 12 minutes of that. Uh, I think that I'm not shocked at all that he's going back to the Warriors, and his timeline is perfectly lined up with Steph Curry. I don't think that after Steph Curry's career, Steve Kerr will remain the head coach of the Golden State Warriors. I don't think that's a hot take. Uh, if you think it is, I don't know why. But uh, but yeah, that made perfect sense. It was no shock. And if you're out here thinking, well, you know, this wasn't going to get done, or or he hadn't done good enough things. You don't know how the Warriors work. Man, Steph Curry is not playing for another head coach. Didn't matter. It didn't matter what the opinion of the Jonathan Kaminga. I have my opinions of it. It didn't matter. Steve Kerr was not going to be the head coach. uh, Or was not not going to be the head coach with Steph Curry on that team. And there's not going to be another head coach barring some medical issue like he had when Luke Walton took over uh, back in the 2016 season. It's not going to happen. That is the head coach of Steph Curry. He's made that abundantly abundantly clear. It's not going anywhere. Real quick, before we get to storylines, uh, Tyson Simpson, he is out at Virginia. I think that's a shock. That's That was we the hype around Simpson and Baldwin uh, was immeasurable in Virginia. So to, to not see that happening in just the five minutes, he's been so awesome. In less than five minutes, he's averaging five and a half points, two plus boards. I mean, he was dominant. Johnny Baldwin has also been dominant, uh, but for Simpson to step away, I think this is a bad sign uh, for Tony Bennett's future. Uh, not necessarily that the program would move on from him, excuse me, but that the recruits, if you're a top recruit, can you trust Virginia? And look, we've seen a lot of similar prep guys taking their college visits. You know one team that's been absent of that visit carousel? Virginia. I don't think that's any mistake. I don't think that's any uh, coincidence. I think there's there's some intention behind that. I think that this saga has not helped Tony Bennett and his standing uh, with elite recruits that feel that they can go to a program, get great coaching, and then you know move on to the SWBA level. So, doldrums. Simmeral prep season. Midway point. We're going to go through top five storylines for the second half of of the regular season. And this I'm going to extend into the playoffs. We might, we'll probably do something similar right ahead of the race to one to kind of say what are we what do we look for within that. Uh, but these are the stories that I'm most looking forward to. First off, Philadelphia. How many wins do they get to? The easy, the easy storyline would be how long does the winning streak go? That's obvious. I don't think that needs to be said. So what I'm more f- curious about is how far does this go? They're a good team. They're, they're emerging. They've got a really underrated star in Monte Parson. Um, I think that's more underrated in the eyes of those who rank and not necessarily underrated in the eyes of the league itself. Uh, but he's been absolutely phenomenal. Him and Nas Hall have made up a really great one-two punch. The record for wins in a season albeit one season, is 23 wins. They're at 13. They've got 15 games to go. So they've got 10 wins that they need to accomplish in 15. I think it could. I think, I'm think i not going to say it will happen, but that's a very doable mark for them. And it seems like years ago that they were sitting at 2-3 and three and we were wondering about their future. They've been obviously 11. So where do they get to? How far does this thing go? The winning streak is the obvious one, but how many wins can we get them up to? What are we going to see at the end of this? And that's part of second storyline, the pursuit of 20 wins. So last season, three of the final four teams had 20-plus wins. One season, again, is a tiny sample size, and we had six teams reach that 20-win mark last season. So I'm curious who gets there. Philadelphia, Beast, Lakeshore Drive, Cascadia are the best position. They're at 12, or in the case of Philadelphia, excuse me, 13 wins. Heartland Zombie Stars is at 10. They haven't yet played uh, half their games yet. OGs are also at 10. I could see them making a run. Yes, Oceania is at 10 wins. I'm not quite as 
putting my pot committed to them getting to the 20 win mark it's possible but they're t- 10 and 7 it, it would take a really nice second half for them to do it it, it because they're already past it, partially why. But so who who are we going to get to? Because I think that's the first line in the sand that we can say this is the team that's got a legitimate shot. We've talked about the, the similar prep middle class. We're going to talk to them in a little bit. But 20 wins is kind of that first mark in the sand, right? And of course, APAC made it. They were 16 wins, 16 and 15 a year ago. Something like that is probably going to happen in the race to one. But 20 wins just feels like this is a team that we can believe in actually being a title team. So who among this list right now, like I said, I think there's four teams that are in great position for it with another two that just need to be consistent with where they have been in order to get there as well. Third one, Queen City Kings. Do they actually figure it out? They've teased us, man. They've teased us. Five-game winning streak in the middle of the season. We thought, okay, hold on. This team is is turning it around. Aside from that five-game winning streak, They've gone two and nine. That is a 18.1 point or percent winning percentage, which would be the second worst in the league. Whether they like it or not, they entered this season with exceptionally high expectations because of the pieces that they brought in. I know Skinny Washington wanted to call them the 32nd worst team. He might actually be right, 31st technically, but. Those expectations were real. Since then, one of those signings, Renzo Bryan, he's gone. Second one, Nick Hugo, barely plays. He's barely making an impact. He plays plenty, but he's not making much of an impact. So are we going to actually see this resurrection? We saw this five-game winning streak. We said, okay, Skinny's cooking. What's what's coming next? I, nothing. Nothing's coming next. Just a continuation of what they've been on. So do they turn it around, <clears throat> or is this a lost season? All right, which mid-tier team emerges from the crowd? Currently, there are 18 teams within three games of 500. Five are on either side, above and below it. Within that, seven of them are two or more games above 500. So nearly half of our 18 teams that are floating around 500 are above it by two or more games. So we're already kind of seeing the waters parting and and two two very serious lines on either side of, of 500 emerging. So who among them actually emerges as a team that's that's dangerous? Gulf Coast, reigning Trey's Bay Area, they have the three best players. Kai Killens, Jaffet Towns, Trey Hyman. Best Coast is a very close fourth place behind them with the emergence of Suno Chapa. However, all four of those teams, the supporting cast has just been meh. Carson Cutworth had a much better game the last time out for Gulf Coast lockdown, but he was not good when they were losing three in a row. The reigning trays have really struggled to find anybody, and man, you wish Kavon Jackson had made this leap for the reigning trays and not Cascadia. Bay Area is deep-ish, but they're not star deep-ish enough for this to be anything but Trey Hyman. AT Aliens has been hot and cold, which by the way, are we are we panicking now? Is Are we allowed to do that? I know we were supposed to be saying this team was awesome. They were top 10, where they, we needed to, they demanded our respect. Well, they're 13th now. They lost. Are we, can we panic now? Like, what's the, just, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't know. I'm asking for direction from the powers that be down in Hotlanta. Let me know how I'm supposed to feel about you now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Southeast is a legacy program, but they don't quite have the same oomph, the same firepower that they did last season. It seems like, it feels like one of them will emerge and make a run. Who's it going to be? I don't know. I'm not sitting here to say I have some answer, uh, some stake in the ground. I don't know. I really don't. Gulf Coast, maybe. They they had the best start of those teams. Rending Trays, I think, probably has the best player. But who among them emerges to kind of pull this team to be a a, a contender um, come the race to one? And then the last storyline. Will the one-star system fail? I've ruled out one-star teams. I've, I've gone on record. I've declared that. Um, I stand by it. I'm not trying to walk back my take here, but I'm interested to see if it holds true. I am I am a, I'm not smart enough to be, but I'm a scientist in a lab waiting to see if this thing pans out. There's no denying the glory of the teams like OGs, Gulf Coast, Raining Trades, the intrigue of them, Indy Stripes, add them to that with, with Dylan Harper. Their top guys are awesome. Their top guys are incredible. Let's, let's throw Bay Area because I don't want to get any flack for not mentioning somebody. But can they actually do it? Can they buck the system? Right. We go back to the Cooper King Cross uh, at the time Washington Star Squad. They fizzled out. 
they couldn't get it done. We, we look at the one-star teams a season ago um, with, you know, the OGs with, uh, with DJ Wagner not making a deep run. Are we going to see that again? Or can one of these pieces, one of these star guys, actually make the run? This is a declaration, and as I said, I'm standing behind it, but it's really more accurately a hypothesis. And I think with two seasons, it was evidence enough to declare it or at least make it definitive, but I'm ready to see if it's a harebrained idea or if we see some teams try to start messing around with it, breaking that rule. And if they start breaking the rule, is that the outlier or is that the main? And just having the full scope of information at our disposal to start deciding once our teams do or do not succeed, well, we got one more season to try to figure that out. All right, we are on a couple broadcasts this week, traveling the universe, traveling SimWorld prep landscapes in a couple local gyms. So catch those uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday games. And then uh, we'll be back here on Monday and then occasionally on some glorious nature walks before uh, the humidity sets in in South Florida. All right, we'll talk to you